studies, they led me to look into the missions in outer space. First, I looked into the Apollo missions to the moon. Then I wondered why we hadn't been back to the moon in 45 years. I wondered why even now we didn't at least have a fleet of rovers scouring every inch of the moon, including its other side that we didn't even land on. But apparently there's a competition to get rovers on the moon. But I mean, we have a rover on Mars. Why didn't we at least send one rover up to the moon to constantly observe it since we no longer send humans? It's just hard for me to imagine that we've already discovered and observed everything we could learn about the moon during those three years of Apollo missions. You know, we've never put a woman on the moon, only men. So why not send our first woman to the moon? That would be a spectacular accomplishment. At least I think so. But then I came across a video of Don Pettit. He's a very outspoken NASA astronaut who's been to outer space three times. He said this is why we haven't been back to the moon. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and it's a painful process to build it back again. Then I found out about the Van Allen radiation belt. Here's what a NASA engineer has to say about the Van Allen radiation belt. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. So yeah, I found it really interesting what that NASA engineer said about the Van Allen belt. And it turns out that other NASA folks have said the same thing about leaving low Earth orbit. And what comes after the International Space Station once its mission is over? How do we ensure the presence of humans in space? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go, and this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to, and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. The technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. So we have a really robust exploration program at NASA. And here's a quick look at the technology that we used to make it to the moon. Here's an image of the command module being rescued in the ocean. This made it to the moon and through the Van Allen belt and back to Earth. Here's video of a command module taking off from the moon. Here are some images I downloaded from NASA's website showing the module and a close-up of the technology that we sent to the moon. So yeah, I was surprised to hear about the Van Allen belt because we went to the moon nine times and sent 12 men during the Apollo missions from December of 1968 to December of 1972. I'm kind of a detail-oriented guy, so I wanted to learn more about all this because while I'm detail-oriented, I'm also pretty cynical and extremely curious about things that don't immediately click but I got sidetracked during my research because I came across Neil deGrasse Tyson saying something kind of weird. If you didn't know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, and he's pretty well known inside the science community. So here's what he said. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, you, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And, so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate. And officially, it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby is a good word. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. 
I researched this statement because it didn't make sense as a documentary called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. And while it looks like there's some disinformation in this video, it does address a few things that kind of make you think twice. It does seem to address some valid questions. Here's some video from it. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency? Nearly $60 million each. Though they had fewer parts than a Jeep. Where was all this money going? Then there's the flag, blowing in the wind, at least twice, on the atmosphereless moon. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronauts' movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth. It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 brought a high resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low definition black and white camera. In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed, which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts, rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Understand too that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Hi, Roger dear. We just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get to playback we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we Shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window under it, any uh, reflected light. And we only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. This is where the astronaut is back in view, but the lens was supposed to be on the window. Is it legitimate? I don't know. There's just so many weird things about the Apollo missions when you research them. And again, I'm not vouching for a funny thing happen on the way to the moon, but it does address a few questions that seem to make sense, that seem to be worth asking. Let's go back to the moon for a moment, because some have pointed out how there's no crater underneath the lunar module landing. The jet propulsion would have likely created a crater, or at least some type of big marking, from its landing. There isn't any dust anywhere, though, not even on the legs or feet of the module. I would think that some kind of dust or rocks should have been blown around from the lunar module landing on the moon. Keep in mind that the module had a 10,000 pound thrust engine, except it seems to have left no disturbance underneath it. Also, Neil Armstrong is sitting on top of that engine when it's initially landing on the moon, but he's heard clear as day when they're landing. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. 
three feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Great shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. 